Hello, this is Bible Academy. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo, and today we are looking at Psalm 10. But before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our sins, that we are controlled by the Spirit of God. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this wonderful privilege we have to study your word. We ask that we'll have open hearts and minds to your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 10 is what is called a lament psalm. L-A-M-E-N-T. A lament psalm is a cry to the Lord. Uh, it's a cry for help in time of need, like sickness or war, some sort of affliction. It could be a number of situations the believer could be in whenever he feels he needs God's help. In ancient Israel, the worshiper would usually go to the temple to offer a prayer like this or have a priest offer it in his behalf. Now in this psalm, the offerer first asks the Lord why he's not taking action against the wicked. These wicked are afflicting the weak of which he is one. He appeals to the Lord to act. That is pretty much the front and back end of this psalm. Let's go ahead and get into it. You will note there is no inscription. Verse 1 begins with a complaint to God. Why, Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide in times of trouble? Let's look at the word hide for a moment, then we'll look into the interpretation. The word hide, the hephil imperfect of alam. It means to conceal or hide. And sometimes you want to look at these words to see if there's a alternate meaning that might change the interpretation. This is pretty clear. The psalmist is speaking, asking these questions. It looks to him as though the Lord doesn't even care what's going on. From all appearances, the Lord does not want to help him. To him, the Lord seems to be hiding or keeping himself away and not getting involved in his situation. Add to that, he's not getting any relief or answers as he sees it. And what is so relevant about a psalm like this is that all of us, as we grow spiritually, we're going to come to points in our lives when we just ask the question, what is going on? What is God doing? And often, we don't get an answer. We may think we have an answer when we try to answer it ourselves, and there may be occasion when we're right, but there are going to be challenges, and there's going to be times when we do not know why God doesn't change the situation. And one of the things that is appealing about the Psalms is it does speak from the heart. And it has tremendous relevancy. Now as we continue in this Psalm, we're going to see the age-old question come up again. That is, why do the wicked prosper and have so much power over the weak and godly? it seems that would only be normal that God's people would not be being put down all the time. 
that they wouldn't be con uh, afflicted or be in the weaker position. But if you've studied many of the studies on video with me, you have learned by now that often Christians are suffering at the hands of the unbeliever, the wicked, and the world. There's reasons for that. We've studied them along the way. It's been a great test of faith for many over the many generations that this happens as it will be for us. And yet we're told to count it joy when we suffer. That's from James. Now verses 2 through 11 speak of the dominance and actions of the wicked. In pride, the wicked hotly pursue the afflicted. They, referring to the afflicted, are caught in the trap which they, the wicked, devise. <clears throat> the word for hotly pursue, uh, it actually means basically burn, the word is dalak, to set on fire. So it's used as a figure for someone who would hotly pursue someone. As I said, sometimes you look, need to look at the words to see is that really what it means, and that is the way this term is defined. The afflicted, let's expand on that just a moment, an adjective, Ani, the afflicted are those who are hurt, who are in a poor situation financially, perhaps physically, uh, are not able to fend for themselves. Also means humble, those who are in humble situations. They haven't got much, uh, they're not very high in society, they're not secure as so many people seek security today. They're in a weak position. So, looking at our verse again, the wicked in pride, to read it in order, in pride the wicked hotly pursue the afflicted. They often, the wicked often, will work against those who are weaker, have some sort of or in some sort of situation where they can't get out of it. Now the wicked here, another term for evil, one of the reasons they do this is because they cannot tolerate the righteous living believer. I put that in terms that express the believer is actually living out his righteousness. The wicked are out to get the righteous. Keeping in mind they're part of the world system. The world system is basically run by Satan himself. It's his system in place imposed upon the world. And he basically rules the world through his system. As God allows it. And believers are the targets. Here we see in our verse that the afflicted are caught in the trap of the wicked. So the wicked set up these traps. It may be in many areas. It may be anything from someone who has some sort of financial authority over you or maybe uh, an employer, uh, a manager. It may be those in a church situation. Any number of areas where the wicked get a foothold in that organization. They set up traps for the righteous. And the righteous do get caught in them. This is the way the world is. We are in the world. We're not out of the world yet. Though one day we will be. A blessed day that shall be. Now, in a real world sense, 
this is where the wicked take advantage uh, causing the believer to maybe lose his job his reputation completely distort it uh, perhaps something that believer the believers have worked for for years to get where they are and then they find the wicked destroying it yes the Lord lets this happen the wicked are successful both in what they do and how they hurt the righteous and that's when we come to a psalm like this and raise the question where is the Lord in all this well let's go a little further with the wicked in verse 3 for the wicked boast over the cravings of his deepest desire himself and the violent robber curses and spurns the Lord the word for deepest self is the Hebrew word that basically means um, well it basically means that which breathes you see it in early Genesis we use it to refer to self or a living being a person so it's basically your simple inner self that includes your desires your emotions the idea is that the, the wicked talks about what he wants and he often gets it he anticipates getting his deepest desires fulfilled now the violent robber the cow participle of Batsal this is a person who gains by violence unjust or dishonest gain so robber is being used here more of a general term it may be somebody who has like I said earlier financial control uh, might hold your mortgage hold your loan uh, hold you over the fire somehow financially or perhaps might be a landlord or some other person who has some authority over you and you find that they weren't honest with you from the beginning they've broken promises maybe they're even able to get away with breaking contracts but the situation is that they are basically getting things from you now the robber here the idea is that they will even use violence so it can go to the point of being someone violent he curses now the word curse unusual for this word here you usually sit in the context of blessing and that's basically uh, usually what it's used for Barak but in some context it means the opposite look at who is doing it for a bad person to bless well it means the opposite he's cursing so what we have here is a situation where this <clears throat> wicked person when he thinks when he speaks first of all he speaks of what he's going to accomplish what he's going to do and then the violent robber which is here in parallel with him that means it's basically the same type of person he curses and spurns the Lord so he is trying to call down something bad he doesn't speak of the Lord in a good way at all uh, this is a way of him expressing his power he thinks he has power over God so he can put down his name or his honor he also spurns the Lord that's the idea that he treats him with contempt no respect no fear no reverence whatsoever you know it's 
blankety blank this and blankety blank that. Um, very common language. In fact, I've said this to the children. Do not say, oh my God, in any kind of situation where you're using it as an exclamation, an excitement or reaction. You know, like, oh my goodness, that type of thing. It is not the same thing. You respect the name of God and the name Lord. This is a title of the God of the universe. Lord, as we've used it in our text and we've learned, when it's translated with all four capital letters, refers to the personal name of God. Don't you dare misuse God's personal name or the name God. We don't do that, ever. That's the idea behind this. You spurn who God is or his name. So the wicked has no regard or fear of the Lord and the way he speaks also. He says what he wants about God. Cursing, foul language, blasphemous words. He spurns the Lord. He is contentable towards God with any thought, without any thought of retribution or judgment. Now, verses 4 through 7, we read what the wicked think and say even more. Verse 4. The wicked in the arrogance of his face does not seek him, that's God. All his thoughts are, there is no God. Now, this rather strange expression, the wicked in the arrogance of his face, that's basically... Well, we use the idea here in America that, well, he's snooty. And behind that is the idea that he holds his nose up at someone as if he's better. Or he doesn't need that person. And the idea here is that the wicked doesn't see any need for God. He has his own power. He has the way he's going to do things. He has his own values. His focus is entirely on himself and his cravings, as we saw in the earlier verse. He excludes God or any accountability of judgment that will come. The wicked thinks that since he sees nothing working against him, that God does not affect anything. In fact, he boldly claims there is no God. In verse 5, we see how the wicked prosper. His ways prosper at all times. The psalmist says, Your judgments are on high, out from him his sight. He puffs at all his adversaries. So here we have the psalmist talking to God about the wicked. When he says his ways prosper, now we do think of prosperity in the way of wealth often. This word means something related to that, but not exactly. The word is chill, chill, Basically, it means to be firm or strong, secure. So if a person is secure in everything, today we often think of being financially secure. If, uh, if that doesn't work out, he's still in good shape. You see, he's got a lot of backup. He's got a lot of security. And in this verse, it speaks of the wicked having that type of appearance, at least the way we understand it in real truth, of being prosperous at all times. 
Yes, they have the big bank accounts. They drive the nice cars. They are in a position of control. There's no real challenge to them, and so on. The phrase, your judgments are on high, out from him. The idea is that the psalmist sees the wicked, tells the Lord that he sees your judgments as so far away as if they're non-existent. He sees you, Lord, as completely out of the picture. And then this rather interesting translation, he puffs. Now, what that basically means is he, um, it's hard to express over a microphone, but basically it's when someone goes, <sighs> he disdains all his adversaries as if they're nothing. They're no one to bother him. You know, they're like a mosquito. They'll just swat them away. And this tells us the power that the wicked has. In their mind, they are going to control everything. Now, we're not talking about just the people who are very powerful positions, but those who uh, just have the attitude. And they act as though they got a lot of power. <clears throat> I often come across in my work, uh, actually people of all ages, who drive cars up to where I work and they let their music play very, very loud, so much it shakes the building. And uh, you can tell they're not that well off, unless they're drug dealers then how are they well off that way? They have a roll of money, but really their lives are full of lust and have no orientation at all towards God. And you see these people and you hear them and you hear them play their radios really loud. It's an indication that they think they have power over people. They're going to make you listen to their often horrible rap or some other kind of music. Here the wicked puffs at his adversaries, thinking nothing is coming his way and no one can do anything about it. Verse 6 describes what he says to himself. He says to himself, I will not be shaken from one generation to another generation. In other words, never, because there is no adversity for me. The wicked and prosperous person sees himself as invulnerable to serious adversity, ever. Nothing at no time will shake him. He sees himself secure and strong and safe. Listen to his mouth in verse 7. His mouth is filled with curses and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is mischief and wickedness. Now the word for mischief means trouble. The word for wickedness means sorrow and affliction. So this person speaks what he thinks and this is often an indicator how wicked he is with all his wealth and power and so-called security he is filled with curses who does he curse just about everything and everybody over whatever situation is in against people who do not let him get his way, the righteous who do not play along, even God, sometimes to just show how powerful he thinks he is. And this is one way in which the wicked express their true selves. 
their inner hatred toward everyone and everything they can't control. And even things and people they can control. They're never happy. They always got to hurt people. He uses his tongue to cause trouble for others. To promote himself. And devise his wicked schemes. He sets people up to make them look bad and himself good. He likes to intimidate people with threats and bully them. He will try to destroy those who get in his way. And by the way, they enjoy doing this. They enjoy the power lust. He feels he has power over someone when he can curse them. Now, we've been describing a wicked person and many of his, uh, what, many ways in which he speaks and which he acts. We're going to see more in a moment how he acts towards the afflicted. But what I want us to understand is the wicked, there's a pretty broad scale of degree of how wicked people can become. Sometimes people are just occasionally acting out their wickedness. Sometimes they're wicked almost every time you see them. Depending on the situation. Often they're just mean. They're mean-spirited. When they get in certain situations, you, if you can observe it, they are just terrible towards people, the way they treat people, especially the weak. And that is part of this psalm, is showing how they act towards the weak, toward the old people, toward those who in some way are at a disadvantage. As I've gotten older, I've seen how people have treated me differently over the years. Now, what you don't know is that I'm a pretty big guy. And I still have a fairly muscular build for my age. And to put it one way, most people don't mess with me. But I see what they do to other people. I've seen what they do. Even in business, how they go in and bully people around. It's pathetic what they do. But it just shows you what's in their mind. Now, verses 8 through 9. These verses describe him like a criminal and a wild animal. He sits in ambush places of the villages. In hidden places he murders the innocent. He is, his eyes hide for the innocent. He lies in ambush like a lion in a thicket. He lies to seize the afflicted. He seizes the afflicted when he draws him into his trap. He crushes, he beats down, and the helpless fall by his mighty claws. The picture here is of him sitting, waiting for his victims. He's like a violent robber or a hungry, man-eating lion who waits in the dark or thicket, and then when his victim comes along, he pounces like a lion on unsuspecting, helpless prey. He seizes his victim by drawing them into a trap. In practical terms, he destroys the reputation or the career of someone. Those who are already in a weaker position, he pushes them down further. 
he's won the favor of the supervisors so he can get his way with what he wants with someone below him. He thinks of ways to discredit his victim using his tongue, manipulation, or some other means to make them look like a failure or weak. The expression, he crushes, he beats down, and the helpless fall by his mighty claws. Well, the picture again is like a huge lion. He pounces on the helpless uh, creature that he jumps on. He's crushed him with his weight. He beats them down with his paws, clawing at them. The helpless fall by his might. This is the way the wicked works. He sees himself as unaccountable to God. Verse 11. He says in his heart, God forgets. He has hidden his face. He will not see. These contemptible statements imply that he does not see God doing anything about what he's getting away with. Now, this is a psalmist telling the Lord what the wicked do and think. But what he thinks here, well, in fact, the opposite is true. God doesn't forget. God knows everything. He knows what's going to happen. He's everywhere. He sees everything, even people's thoughts. So you can see here that the wicked has his own idea about God, the way he shuts him out of his life. He mistakes the ways and timing of God for God not knowing or able to do anything about it. And what the wicked does is what, well, a lot of people do this. They shape God and the image they want to. In other words, their God is what they think he is, not the God of the Bible. Now, once the wicked thinks that God is not going to do anything about what he does, he sees himself getting away with almost anything he wants. So he gets to where he totally ignores God. The wicked grows in his confidence to get away with more and more and run over more people. He thinks he's getting away with so much when in fact God is giving him a little more time to repent because once he dies, it is over for him or her forever. Well, these last several verses, we've heard the observations of the righteous. Him going to God about it. His complaint, you might say. The reasons for his lament, his cry. Beginning in verse 12, we see the faith of the righteous begin to break through. 12, 15, 12 through 15, the call for God to act. The call for God to act. Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand. Do not forget the afflicted. Why has the wicked spurned God? He says in his heart, you will not seek an accounting. So here we see the righteous calling on God to act, presenting his case to God. Arise, O Lord. That means act now. Lift up your hand in two ways. To deliver the afflicted and put the wicked in his flat place. So when he says, lift up your hand, it's saying, God, act. Deal with them. Deliver us. Put the wicked in his place. The psalmist reminds God of what the wicked is thinking, why he needs to be judged. 
One reason is he doesn't think he's accountable. Now listen for a moment. Accountability is really a big issue with the wicked. When they erase from their minds the possibility of judgment or some future accountability, they do not see wrongdoing as an issue, what we call sin. So they see no need to repent, no need for salvation or a savior. When they do not believe there's any kind of judgment, they feel free to do what they want. But this is often just a mind game. They don't think about it. That's some distance in the future. In verse 14, the psalmist begins to answer his own questions speaking to the Lord. When he says, For you have seen trouble and suffering. You look to take it into your hand to care for it. The helpless victim commits himself to you. You are a helper of the fatherless. So the psalmist describes what God knows. What he has done. And what he can do and what he anticipates God to do. He knows God has seen all the trouble that the wicked cause. He's seen all the suffering they bring on the righteous. And he anticipates God acting, anticipating that God is going to act. He says this rather awkward verse, you look to take it in your hand. That's a way of saying, you see things, Lord. You see what they are doing. You see what the afflicted are going through. You see that. The helpless victim commits himself to you. You see the weak, the afflicted, put their situation in your hands. And you are the helper of the fatherless. Now the expression fatherless well, when you think of the fatherless, you're thinking of someone who doesn't have a parent. And a parent is the natural protector and provider for a child. And here the afflicted is like a fatherless child. He has no help. He has no protection. He can't really fend for himself because the wicked are so powerful. The psalmist acknowledges that with God. That's an important turning point here. He acknowledges that God knows everything and he's reasoning with God. Now listen to this. He's reasoning with God. He's talking it over with God that you know all of this. And that's the way of the psalmist expressing the fact that he knows himself that God knows and does these things that he's going to do. You know, it comes down to something very simple. We pray or we lament to God about our troubles. We tell him what we think. We reason with him, God, I know you're good. I know your provider. You have done so much for me in the past. And I'm calling for you to act now. Because you will help. You tell us you will. So the psalmist, or even ourselves, when we express a lament like this, we're basically expressing to God what we feel in our heart. Don't ever be afraid to do that. That's what we do to our Father. We tell Him these things. We express our innermost pains, our reasoning about this, what we're thinking. Now, He knows it anyway. But like any good Father, He wants to hear what you think. Principle. Let me put it on the board for you. 
our helplessness is an opportunity for God to work on our behalf. Our helplessness is an opportunity for God to work on our behalf. God knows exactly what's going on with you. He knows how you're dealing with it. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're tempted to do about it. How you might want to take it into your own hands in a wrong way. He knows how much you can take. And of course, he knows what he's doing. Another principle. When the wicked seem to be winning in every way, God is using them to strengthen you, to keep your dependence on the God. It may not seem like it at the time, but that is a good thing. To keep your dependence on the God of the universe, your creator, the one and only God. So we must learn to commit ourselves to him. And though we don't know his timing, God runs the clock. It's his way of making things right at his time. We wait patiently and let God seek the vengeance. Perfectly punish the wicked and care for the afflicted at his time. In verse 15, the psalmist calls for strong action again. Verse 15. Break the arm of the wicked and evil man. Seek an accounting of his wickedness which he thought you would not find. Well, this kind of livens things up here. Break his arm. That's a way of breaking his strength. The arm represents strength. This is a way of saying break the strength of the wicked and evil man. Hold him accountable. So the, commas, the psalmist now is following through with God taking action. He thinks he's so powerful. Break that power. It's time to put a stop to this. Seek an accounting of his wickedness, which he thinks he's not going to be accountable for. You see? Now what we need to remember, if we put ourselves in this psalmist's shoes, is that we know God has to be fair and just. That's part of his character. So, we don't need to question the fact that God won't deal with this man in a righteous and just manner. It's just that we don't always know when and how much we're going to have to get beaten up. Verse 16. In fact, verses 16 through 18 expresses more confidence in the Lord that his prayer is going to be answered. Listen to what he says about the Lord. The Lord is king forever and ever. Nations have perished from his hand. So basically what the psalmist is saying is he knows the Lord's potential. He knows that he's on his throne forever He's in control. He is sovereign. Now, if this was David, which it could have been, it could refer to a nation that's, that he's at war with. For us, God can make the wicked disappear just as easily as he could a nation in the days of David. The psalmist is confident that these people will perish when the Lord is good and ready. Listen to some of this confidence in verse 17 when he says, You have heard the desire of the oppressed, O Lord. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear. To sum it up, the psalmist knows his prayers do not go unheard. 
the Lord will respond. Now, folks, when you get in this situation, it may be years that you're in it. It may be some area of your life that you cannot, you cannot get out of. It may be the burden you have to carry. You may have to carry it all your life. You know the Lord hears you. And your situation may be one of those in which every day you have to call upon the strength of the Lord to deal with it. That's the way he's designed it for you. If you were totally trouble free, you might wake up one day and say, why do I need the Lord? I'm dealing with this myself. We have an expression here, hold their feet to the fire, hold them accountable. And what we're actually saying here is that God holds us to where we can depend upon Him. He lets us go through these things. And sometimes, well, from my heart, I will tell you, I just get tired of seeing the wicked prosper. Getting away with so much. Hurting so many people. Hurting the weak. Let's look at these three expressions. All three of these phrases indicate that the psalmist knows for certain that the Lord will act. His first one, you have heard the desire of the oppressed. That's a way of saying, God heard your prayers. God hears your prayers. You don't speak a word from your heart to God that he misses. And he knows your intention and your meaning and your pain. The next one, he will strengthen the heart of the oppressed. He will give you strength. He will give you what you need to get through, even if it just feels like you're barely getting through. He'll give it to you that night, or that day, or that moment. Finally, he will incline his ear, meaning he does answer. This doesn't mean he just hears it. He will answer it. As the ultimate, ultimate king, and ruler over the people of Israel, God would destroy their enemies. He'll protect his people. Now, as our Heavenly Father, he always hears our prayers when the world and those who are slaves to it have beaten us down. He will give us strength. We keep asking him for it. We keep waiting for his deliverance. He will strengthen, even if it's just enough to get by. There are going to be times, it may be right now, when you feel yourself being in a very weak position. You can't get out of it. You call for God to deliver you. You keep calling, because that's what He wants. And you express your faith when you keep calling to God to deliver you. You expect one day he will deliver because he will. The psalm ends rather abruptly. To what end does the Lord hear our prayers? Verse 18. This sums it up. To judge or defend on behalf of the orphan and the oppressed. So that the man who is of the earth, earthlings, will no longer terrify them. So these last two lines sum up the answer to the prayer. The Lord will judge, defend as judge, he makes the perfect judgment. 
for the oppressed and the orphan. Again, orphan is like the fatherless, don't have their natural protector. He will defend those who are being afflicted and wronged by the wicked. And then to the point that these people are of the earth, that is the earthlings, so that the man who is of the earth, that's a way of saying they're people of this planet, they're people of this world, not heaven bound like us. They are not, they are not in Christ. They are not God's children, adult sons of God. These earthlings will no longer terrify terrify the afflicted. It's going to end. Now, this is the first time we've actually seen this in this kind of wording, but the idea is that the wicked try to intimidate and scare their victims. For the weak and helpless, they have no defense. Their only defense is God, and that will do. God will come to the defense of those who are weak or in weak positions. They really can't defend themselves. Another thing you might keep in mind, when you find yourself in those situations <clears throat> under the thumb, under the authority, caught in the trap of the wicked, you remember this. God let you go there. God, to put it another way, put you in that position so he can care for you in a way in which you needed it. To teach you to learn to depend upon him in everything and in every way. On the other side of that, when he's ready, the wicked, well, God will deal with them. And when he does, they'll be over with, they'll be history, they'll be done for. Let's go back and read again just about the entire last half of the psalm where the psalmist calls for the Lord to act. Back up to verse 12. Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand, do not forget the afflicted. Why has the wicked spurned God? He says in his heart, you will not seek an accounting. For you have seen trouble and suffering. This is a psalmist speaking. You look to take it in your hand. The helpless victim commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and evil man. Seek an accounting of his wickedness, which he thought you would not find. The Lord is king forever and ever. Nations have perished from his hand. You have heard the desire of the oppressed, O Lord. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to judge on behalf of the orphan and the oppressed so that man who is of the earth will no longer terrify them. O oh, Father, we thank you that you've given us more words to express our own heart at times when we are feeling afflicted or weak or stuck in some situation that we can't get out of. Lord, teach us from this psalm that we're to go to you, to express our inner thoughts and feelings, to even reason with you and, and then call you to action because we know that you are the king on your throne forever challenges with these words. In Jesus' name, amen.